And I'm very pleased to welcome you to our very first uh, seminar series, Redirections, for the second semester. Um, tonight, we're very lucky to have our honorary professor, um, Michalino Zemblas, and we look forward to his presentation. And we will then have a discussion and questions afterwards and some food at the end. So thank you very much, and let's welcome Michalinos. Thank you. I'm not going to sing. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Andre for organizing this, and I'm excited to be part of Cresced, and uh, it's an exciting week. Um, so my talk today is uh, about how to bring together two sets of arguments that have surprisingly not been thought together in the decolonization debates. Uh, on the one hand, it is the literature on higher education as a public good, what this means, what it implies, why it is important, and on the other hand, it is the demand for decolonizing higher education, why it is necessary, how it should be done more effectively and strategically, and so on. The argument that I will advance today is that Decolonization is not merely an effort to resist processes of colonization that are still going on in universities. Rather, decolonizing higher education is a process that is to the public interest and the wider transformation of a society because it dismantles the normative, ethical, and political limits of higher education as we know it and explores alternative possibilities that promote the public good. I'm clearly not referring only to the case of South Africa, because I see decolonization as a wider ethical and political project that concerns universities and therefore societies around the globe. So I'm arguing for decolonization as a wider and global project, because knowledge in many uh, places around the world is colonized in the sense that knowledge from the colonial centers is consistently treated as powerful, it is privileged over local no knowledges, and it persistently produces unjust effects of power. So let me begin by saying that higher education is widely assumed to be a major social good. In his 1929 essay entitled National Mindedness and International Mindedness, George Herbert Mead wrote that to be interested in the public good, we must be disinterested, that is, not interested in goods in which our personal selves are wrapped up. This statement, so I believe, provides the philosophical foundation and reflects the passionately opposing views that still accompany debates about the way individual and common good are understood in Western societies since Aristotle's time. What is the public good? Who defines it? Where does personal interest end? And of course, the question I'm adding today, what do decolonization debates have to do with the public good? Two features of Aristotelian views are worthwhile to consider because they provide the ground for the opposing views that have developed since then. The first one is that the individual person must integrate the various goods and pursuits that make up his or her daily affairs into the overall good that is happiness or flourishing and that gives life its end. The second is that these practices, institutions and actions must be coordinated by the larger human community. Aristotle's idea of a public 
emphasizes that as a deliberative body, the public seeks to advance a common good, and thus it is more than the sum of individuals who compose it. Aristotle's idea of a public also concerns a shared identity, membership in a polis, as well as a shared fate. Only those who are conscious of this shared identity and who are able to put private interest aside in deliberating about collective, collective action are truly interested in the public good. Education in general and higher education in particular are unavoidably entangled in debates concerning what counts as public good. For example, when it comes to the purpose of universities, especially in light of contemporary neoliberal interests around the world. A parenthesis here, uh, generally speaking, neoliberalism emphasizes three things. First, a commitment to individual liberty and a reduced state. Second, an ideology against government intervention. And third, a belief that market forces should be allowed to be self-regulating. Therefore, if educational institutions, including universities, serve public good, they should ideally be defined and evaluated by their unique goal to renew, I emphasize this, to renew the public by providing individuals with the skills dispositions and perspectives required to engage with others about their shared interests and common fate. Yet, what this implies for higher education is not always clear or uncontested, especially in relation to the possibility that universities serve public good at the same time that they serve their private, that is, financial interests. Furthermore, what higher education for public good means in the context of efforts toward decolonization has clearly material, ethical, political, and epistemic dimensions, which together shape social relations and enshrine categories that are then used to justify occupation of indigenous land, claims about the universality of Western thought, capitalist and neoliberal relations and modes of production, possessive individualism, and the very concept of race. Under the broad umbrella of higher education for the public good, there might exist many paradoxes, disagreements, and diverse visions for how decolonizing possibilities can contribute to the public good. These competing visions, I argue, should become part of decolonization debates, namely whether decolonization projects overlap with, are reducible to, or are inconsumable with other justice and public good projects. Consequently, any effort to address decolonization in higher education necessarily entails the exploration not only of the difficult understandings of decolonization, but also of public good itself. While higher education is certainly considered to be a good, there have been considerable debates around the world as to whether or not higher education itself is a public good. Traditionally, the debate goes like this. On the one hand, there is the view that higher education is a public good because every individual who benefits from higher education can potentially contribute to a common good with the skills, dispositions, and perspectives he or she acquires. Several countries, for example, subsidize higher education through such means as grants and student loans. On the other hand, there is objection against public funding of higher education on the basis of the idea that not everyone will attend a public university or benefit from this funding. These debates raise further questions such as Whose interest does higher education really serve? 
How does funding higher education contribute to societal transformation? Or even further, how should higher education for the public good be like in a society characterized by gross inequality, inequalities such as South Africa? Southern thinkers like Australian sociologist Rawin Connell argues that we need to move beyond the neoliberal managerial model that has become dominant in contemporary university systems around the world. Connell's writings recognize the complexities of education in social, cultural, and political terms while pushing the boundaries of how to translate theoretical discussions on justice into practical, everyday conditions. One of Connell's constructs that is particularly valuable in the case of decolonizing efforts in South Africa is the concept of curricular justice or cognitive justice to use the Sousa Santos term. I would argue that recognizing different manifestations of social justice and social injustice, of which curricular justice is just one of them, is an important task in decolonization efforts to interrogate the complex relationships among inequality, transformation, and higher education. What I will discuss next, then, is how curricular justice in higher education is related to social justice and therefore to the public good. In other words, my aim is to suggest that curricular justice must be accompanied by social justice and as a corollary, Curricular justice is a form of and leads to social justice and transformation. Cornell wrote a number of seminal books and papers from the 90s till uh, very recently, emphasizing that hegemonic curriculum and pedagogical practices are integral to the reproduction of inequality in educational outcomes. In particular, Connell suggests that the basis for a curriculum that does not perpetuate inequalities is the principle of curricular justice. A strategic focus on the interests of the least advantaged groups of students. This focus, argues Connell, is in contrast to the contemporary mainstream curricula in most countries, schools, and universities, which prioritize the interests of the most privileged. Although the construct of curricular justice was originally based on a, on a rather narrow interpretation of curriculum and a focus on compulsory schooling, this construct is increasingly being applied to the higher education sector. Thus, the adapted construct of curricular justice entails three, quote unquote, design principles that ought to be considered in higher education too. First, a just curriculum, as Connell points out, does not simply reflect the knowledge and culture of the least advantaged, but rather requires the critique of all knowledge claims because the least advantaged groups may have adapted to a destructive situation. In other words, the notion of curricular justice emphasizes not only the development of knowledge through the recognition of the interests of the least advantaged, but it also emphasizes how this knowledge may be critical and useful to the communities of people higher education institutions seek to address. The second principle is the participation of the least advantaged groups in a democratic process of deliberation and decision making in higher education rather than a neoliberal managerial process that ignores the harsh realities and ways of being of traditionally marginalized groups. The fees must fall movement in South Africa is an example of the social struggle that is often needed for curricular justice in and around higher education institutions. Finally, the third principle is the development of policies and pedagogies that are geared toward equitable outcomes and prevent the historical production of inequality. For example, curriculum, pedagogy, and assessment 
are to be approached in ways that provide productive practices taking into consideration the viewpoint of the least advantaged, thus creating learning spaces that incorporate curricular justice as a key criterion for academic excellence. In general, Connell's construct of curricular justice advances clearly and thoroughly the idea that higher education holds the premise of contributing to social justice and democratic citizenship rather than being a vehicle for perpetuating social inequalities. The construct of curricular justice is particularly relevant to the colonization debates because a just curriculum has to take into consideration how knowledge is generated in the colonial encounter. So what does it mean to decolonize the curriculum in the, way, in the wake of colonial rule or apartheid in order to promote curricular justice? Or to put this differently, how can curricular justice be advanced through decolonization efforts in higher education? In his recent book titled As by Fire, Jonathan Janssen summarizes six different conceptions of decolonization. I think it's worthwhile to consider the, those as different ways of advancing curricular justice. So here they are. The first one, decolonization as the decentering of European knowledge. This does not mean to get rid of European content, values, ideas, achievements, and so on, but rather to critique and question European legacies and their epistemological, ethical, political, and ontological consequences around the globe. It also means replacing Europe with Africa as the center of the curriculum. The second one is decolonization as the Africanization of knowledge. This means a step further. That is, for example, teaching and learning through the African languages rather than through the colonial language, English. Third, decolonization as additive, inclusive knowledge. This is a soft version of decolonization and entails the addition of content, for example, African studies or authors, in the curriculum. The fourth one is decolonization as critical engagement with settled knowledge. This meaning of decolonization focuses less on repositioning or replacing the existing curriculum than with empowering students to engage critically with knowledge that is taken for granted. The fifth one is decolonization as encounters with entangled knowledges. This meaning of decolonization acknowledges that knowledges are entangled. There are no pure colonizer or colonized knowledges, but rather knowledges are intertwined. As Jonathan Janssen writes, and I quote, this reality of entangled knowledges is especially valid in post-1994 South Africa, where former, en former enemies quite literally breathed down each other's necks in shared social spaces such as schools and universities and engaged with the same troubled knowledge contained in the curriculum, end of quote. And the last one, is decolonization as repatriation of occupied knowledge and society. This is a hard version of decolonization that demands the repatriation of land and occupied knowledge to those from whom it was stolen. From this perspective, reconciliation and decolonization are considered inconsumable because the colonization is not about pampering settlers and accommodating their needs in the curriculum, but raising critical consciousness about giving back the stolen land. These six concepts on decolonization are not necessarily inconsumable, but they may be complementary to one another in articulating a decolonizing university that advances curricular justice for the public good. That is, a university that does not simply charge fees and grants degrees or even poses some rudimentary challenges to the neoliberal orientation of many contemporary universities. 
but rather defines itself fundamentally as a university that equips its students with skills toward the applied practice of decolonization. A major issue then as to what is in the public good and how it can be promoted in higher education through a just curriculum becomes a matter of a critical approach towards colonial manifestations of knowledge. In criticizing neoliberal and managerial perspectives in higher education, for example, the construct of curricular justice rehabilitates the political role of higher education as a practice and an institution that joins the struggle for social justice, inclusion, and care for the least advantaged. However, it is less a matter of returning to Aristotle's definition of the public good, as it has been outlined earlier, and more as an issue of recognizing that what we take as higher education for the public good, while integrating private interests when it comes to the purpose of universities, is a matter of ongoing social, political, and historical creation and deliberation. The public good, for example, according to the notion of curricular justice, has to be the outcome of a diversity of perspectives that take into consideration conceptions of access to higher education in the South African context and the system's progress toward the quality of outcomes for all learners, rather than simply being imposed by powerful private interests. Democratic forms of deliberation, reflexivity, criticality, care, humanity, and hopefulness are some of the ideas that are central to a notion of public good helping higher education students and educators explore crucial questions of autonomy, solidarity, and the care of vulnerable others. These ideas arise against a backdrop of forces which continue to reproduce particular forms of power and social inequalities all around the world. The concept of curricular justice suggests that higher education can make an important contribution towards social transformation. But for this to happen, there has to be institutional transformation at the higher education level too. Such transformation demands rethinking and reframing of concepts such as the public versus private goods, social justice, democratic deliberation, and decolonial possibilities, and how they are relevant to curriculum, pedagogy, and assessment. I focus now on three critical issues that create opportunities for this rethinking and reframing to take place. These issues, which I briefly discussed below, are the reconceptualization of public good, the different conceptualizations of social justice, and the value of disruptive and discomforting pedagogies for democratic deliberation. The first issue is the reconceptualization of public good. For example, in defining public good in the context of South Africa, there are concerns about how a public good can be identified when there are not only conflicting interests in the society, but also traumas carried from unresolved issues in the apartheid era. Given these challenges, one way to think of a public is not as Aristotle did, as a group of friends committed to a common good, <laughs> but as a group of strangers who may even be resentful of each other and who carry the emotional burden of the past, yet they are tied together by consciousness of a common fate. The public then, in this context, includes individuals and groups with separate affiliations and identities, even with different private interests, who are traumatized by the past in variable manners, yet who are connected by common concerns and a common future, and whose membership in, the, in this public overlaps with political citizenship. But this citizenship is not the same because they don't have the same agency. 
At issue then is how much higher education can contribute so that people learn to act as citizens in a democracy that promotes social justice. Empirical work in higher education around the world demonstrates how difficult this task is to achieve because past traumas and present inequalities are deeply embedded in how people come to see, understand, and live citizenship. In addition, new needs and private interests as a result of neoliberal economies further complicate the public role of universities. Higher education can make a contribution towards this direction in that it can indeed address the various tensions of citizenship, tensions among egalitarian aims and unequal outcomes, for example, and provide access to the language, the capabilities, and the practices required for democratic deliberation and social transformation. As Mala Singh points out, and I quote, the reinsertion of public good issues into the notion of higher education responsiveness requires the identification of a series of strategic choices for higher education. End of quote. These strategic choices will have to also consider how the public good can be reconceptualized in ways that promote the vision of social justice by fostering decolonizing, disruptive, and hopeful teaching and learning spaces. This idea does not imply that universities' private interests are completely rejected or demonized. However, if universities are really interested in strengthening their public role, they cannot ignore demands for social justice. The second issue, of course, concerns the different conceptualizations of social justice. Research shows, argue Laurie Hill and her colleagues, in their review of research on the access of educa to education in South Africa a few years ago, that there are increasingly complex conceptualizations of access to education and its implications for the educational opportunities and trajectories of disadvantaged uh, groups. These authors suggest that notions of distributive justice, that is emphasis on equality of opportunity and equality of outcome, are not enough to understand whether educational inequalities are successfully addressed in South Africa. Their suggestion is that we pay attention to the ways that relational justice is manifest in the society. That is how the relationships which structure the society, such as the practices and procedures that govern both micro-level relationships and the organization of institutions, such as higher education, really incorporate aspects of social justice such as recognition and respect. Connell's notion of curricular justice then has to consider specifically how it is entangled with relational justice and creates spaces in higher education that nurture the values of relationships, care, compassion, respect, and solidarity. Collectively, these different manifestations of justice strengthen curricular justice as a critical resource for analyzing issues of power in social relations at both the micro and macro levels. At the same time, different manifestations of justice highlight that there are limitations of any approach to distributive or relational or curricular justice frameworks to explain access in a complex social, cultural, and political context without accounting of, for, for issues of agency. Finally, the third issue has to do with acknowledging the value of disruptive and discomforting pedagogical approaches at the higher education level. Recent literature discusses the emotional tensions, ethical dilemmas, and transformative possibilities of using such pedagogies in post-conflict societies. Discomforting pedagogical approaches require considerable vulnerability, and thus the ethical responsibility of educators becomes a complex issue, yet one 
that needs to be boldly addressed in the future. Many educators are concerned by the institutional and normative restrictions of using critical pedagogies in the, in the classroom and admit that there is less and less room in it to negotiate the ethics or politics proposed by critical pedagogies, such as pedagogies of discomfort or disruptive and decolonizing pedagogies. These observations about the ethical, institutional, and normative restrictions show the complexity of handling difficult emotional knowledge in a post-traumatic society and why it is not always productive to address difficult knowledge on the basis of a predetermined collectivity that reiterates we and they distinctions. When examined through the lens of a post-traumatic context, it becomes clearer how and why certain features of pedagogic discomfort concern students and educators beyond divisions of the world into rival camps, such as oppressors and victims. Students and educators come into the classroom carrying their troubled knowledge about, and I quote Jonathan, Jonathan Janssen, about conquest and humiliation, struggle and survival, suffering and resilience, poverty and recovery, black and white. Unsettling this troubled knowledge demands emotional effort, careful listening to each other's traumatic experiences, and explicit discussion of the potential and the harm that troubled knowledge stimulates. The value of pedagogic discomfort in post-traumatic contexts cannot be overstated, though. This process should not be assumed to be always already transformative and beyond question. In other words, there are no guarantees for change in the social and political status quo. A pedagogy of discomfort, especially in light of the tensions identified above, demands time, and realistic choices about what can and what cannot be achieved. Needless to say, not all students will respond in the same way or benefit from pedagogic discomfort in the same manner. Some may adapt some sort of change, others may resist, and still others may experience distress. Therefore, the concern here is not simply about overcoming resistance or motivating students who express apathy or hostility. It is rather a pedagogical commitment to locate, interrogate, and engage troubled knowledge in ways that permit disruption of received authority, as Janssen points out. You may be wondering at this point, to what extent is it possible to decolonize higher education institutions that are supported by the nation state and capital? To what extent can universities really serve as spaces in which decolonization projects are imagined and enacted? If universities were created and adapted to support a colonial order of knowledge and tend to reproduce our existing social system, to what extent can these institutions be transformed without larger social transformation? What intervention approaches might neither reproduce the colonial order nor contest it using colonial terms? In other words, what I'm asking is, how can colonial universities become disloyal to colonialism for the public good? The remainder of my talk revisits Sharon Stein and Vanessa Andreotti's three critical <laughs> approaches that could serve as responses to my questions and take into consideration the issues outlined earlier. The first approach entails both individual and institutional interventions focusing on proportional representation, advocating primarily for increased numbers of low income or black students and faculty, and supplementing existing curricula with non-Western perspectives. In other words, this approach aims 
at enhanced diversity and inclusion of differences, of difference into existing institutions, and it might be characterized as a soft reform approach because it lacks structural analysis and ignores the uneven distribution of power, wealth, and opportunity across race. In relation to the conceptualization of social justice outlined earlier, there is no redistribution, but merely some form of recognition. The second approach entails systemic analysis of the creation of inequalities as, and is characterized by recognition of the epistemological hegemony of Western knowledge and the harms done by existing institutional structures and logic that reproduce racial and economic inequalities. This approach is a more radical one because it takes steps to disrupt colonial structures within the university and promote decolonization practices, yet it falls short in that it may also reproduce some parts of the system as it is difficult to disrupt all colonial elements at once. And the third approach is the most radical of all, as it emphasizes the need to dismantle the structures that orient the university itself. So this is a wider transformative project that challenges higher education as we know it, how it's funded and regulated by the nation state and capital, and the complicities that result from conflicting desires for decolonization and for fulfillment of the promises of the colonial order. While these three approaches are theorized as distinct, they are not inconsumable, but we can see them in a continuum. So in practice, we, may, we make strategic use of these different approaches in each context, depending on what is possible and desirable within any given situation. So the million dollar question for you today is the following. Which of these approaches or combination of them can strategically be more effective for the decolonization and transformation project at NMU? And how do you know this? To conclude now, given the relationship between curricular justice and social justice outlined earlier in my talk, decolonizing the curriculum cannot happen outside the pursuit of social justice. Decolonization then is not an esoteric business of transforming the university. It is rather a public process of transformation that happens at different layers of intervention simultaneously, and thus it is a matter of public good. A decolonizing project of higher education is about a collective rethink and action of higher education for public good around the world, not about dividing South Africa and other universities or dividing Southern and Western universities in the global peripheries. If we want to go beyond simply addressing the symptoms of contemporary problems to address the root causes of colonialism, both in the colonial centers and its former or post-colonies, then we will need to engage in deeper examinations that address not only the epistemological, but also the ethical, political, and ontological frameworks in which higher education is situated. Interventions are needed at all possible layers. Ultimately, a decolonial perspective forces us both within higher education institutions and beyond to think deeply, not just about the epistemological, but the ethical, political, and ontological question of what it means to create universities that equip students with skills toward decolonization for the public good. As Alexis Shotwell argues in his book titled Against Purity, and I quote, political transformation is not an intellectual exercise, 
but instead is a visceral, emotional, commosensical refiguration. That when we engage with efforts to enact social, chance, social change, we are moved on many levels, only some of them rational and conceptual, end of quote. In other words, intellectual work is necessary and valuable, but in itself, it cannot lead us somewhere different. Erika Berman argued too that, and I quote, there is no way we are going to intellectually reason our way out of coloniality in any conventional academic sense, end of quote. We need to re rebuild relational justice as an important aspect of social justice. Can our universities become one of the many spaces in which to make this possible without assuming that such work can even be free from complicity in colonial heart? Thank you very much for your attention. This way. Thank you very much. I think we've got a lot of food for thought and we open the floor for comments and um, questions. Are we all still absorbing? <laughs> Can I ask that you just use the microphone as we're recording this, so thank you. Uh, thank you so much, that was just incredible, thank you, and I love the idea of public good. Um, I have a question though, on, on the thing of public good. Um, if we can ask what is public good in South Africa and, and what is public good, for instance, for the different meaning-making systems that are working in South Africa, or, or living in South Africa, for instance, what is public good according to African philosophy? Um, what would it mean? What would it look like? Um, perhaps that will also give another dimension to, to this idea of what we need to think about. I, I don't think you expect me to answer that. No, no. <laughs> it's more... I'm also not sure that I have the yeah. answer. I yeah. just think that yeah. that might be another avenue to look into. Yeah, but, but this is a very good question. I mean, which is the point I was trying to make, that you know, this, this is an open process of negotiating all the time. It, because many times we either taking, take it for granted that we know what public good is or what common good is, uh, or we totally ignore the question. And, and I think it's an important question to phrase it the way you phrased it. Uh, from, from different perspectives, including African philosophy, yes. Anyone? Anyone else? <coughs> okay, let's go on. Thank you very much for giving us so many ideas to think about and also showing the relationality between different ideas. Um, I very much like the part where you think about um, the heterogeneity of group interests, I would say, or what you call um, not being friends, no? um, mm -hmm. referring to Aristotle's idea of friendship as a basis for creating a common good or a common wealth. And uh, the point is actually that this is not happening. Mm -hmm and uh, that a lot of, um, of the experiences you are relating to are experiences of conflict and are experiences of um, also conflicts of interest. So um, at the beginning also of your talk, you talk about distributive justice and we could say that the notion of relational justice is one that very much appeals to a moral ground that would guide us or recognition. So how do you relate that part on this distributive justice, you know? Um, what would be the changes that would need to happen on a structural level that the part of recognition is being experienced as something that is happening? Okay. 
Uh, whatever you prefer, I don't mind, yeah. It won't be a keynote. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> right. feel free, sir. Uh, I'm trying to ask a question that um, um, is not misleading, but uh, okay, let me give it a go. I mean, you. I think when you talk about a post-traumatic society, for me, it's a particular indication. Um, for me, it's, uh, we're talking about trauma as present, and it's related to uh, a past haunted present. Um, but with many of the other issues you talked about, um, it's related to how the university fits into the economy and society. Uh, I thought your presentation was very rich and you multi-layered. There are many aspects to it which one would readily agree with. Um, but I just want to challenge you um, around some of the issues which mm. we see play out, those of us who are in the academy. Um, for example, the six approaches that you provided from Jensen, to what extent could those be co-opted without changing the structure of the university and its relation to society and the economy. Um, I think you correctly pointed out that if we talk about decolonization, or the, you know, we have to talk about the public good. For me, to talk about the public good, you're gonna have to talk about neoliberalism mm -hmm. and, and how it impacts on the corporate university, whether it's managers who mimic CEOs, whether it's a hierarchy of power, whether it's the emphasis and support given to those faculties and discipline that have a privilege in the marketplace, promoting entrepreneurship, etc., mm -hmm. as opposed to other disciplines, um, which you talk about care, compassion, etc., which lends itself to those values. Uh, I, I really think I should stop there, but um, I'm, I have a dilemma because, and the final point, so with fees must fall, etc., it's contradictory, it's messy, it's the nature of mass movements. Those of us who've been involved in mass movements got our hands dirty uh, and we learned lessons. One of which was, it, wasn't start, it didn't start with removing the statue. There was a very programmatic, long-term involvement with people working with workers. Black workers, particularly black women workers on many campuses. The idea of outsourcing was brought by the IMF World Bank, it started at UCT, spread around all the universities. Yeah. That preceded um, the roads Some must fall, yes, fees yes. must fall, etc. It really challenged those issues you are talking about. Outsourcing as a function of present day capitalist society. Um, um, it then talked about commodification of knowledge. So um, I, I, I can go on, and the students deliberately use decolonization. The many people we know were decolonization scholars, whether it's the people in the unity movement who wrote how Africa contributed to world civilization, or Neville Alexander. You know, I consider them decolonial scholars before the term even appeared uh, presently. But the students decided, and you know, the students are not a homogenous group, but there were some who decided on the word as opposed to transformation. 
Because transformation, they said, has been co-opted. And it's very superficial. And that's what they were talking about, precisely what you are talking about. So I, my fear is that in the same way you told us earlier and your book talks about how human rights mm -hmm. can be co-opted, how multiculturalism was co-opted. Yeah. People use critical multiculturalism, or critical human rights. Now, for many universities, I see the decolonial project quite often as ticking the boxes, not the kind of from the ground, bringing people along. Very importantly, you talked about the democratization process, which cannot be separated from that. So my question is, to what extent can what, what you've been saying and the people you've been quoted, to what extent can that be co-opted? But also the um, question of, um, uh, anyway, I, I really think I should stop. I, I couldn't but agree with just too many questions. more with you, Salim. Um, uh, and, and I will, I, I will respond in a, in kind of in a Foucaultian way that we cannot escape power relations. We cannot escape, you know, being co-opted by, you know, you know, all these different options can really be co-opted. And we mentioned it at the end of the book launch today that there is always the danger of replacing one kind of tyranny with another. When, when this kind of critique or this kind of work becomes hegemonic, then we are, we are in the same loop of, of challenges of making this a moral imperative and therefore, you know, it becomes another hegemonic uh, discourse and practice. So that's why it's important to be constantly vigilant, constantly uh, reflecting on ourselves and the kinds of practices we use and whether there is, you know, this, this danger is always present. So in a sense, all the different possibilities, and, and you're right, I agree with you that the decolonial project could, could become another tick in the box, just like multiculturalist discourses uh, have become another tick in the box in many schools and universities in Europe, as far as I know, uh, including my, my own home country. So it may start with a noble cause, a noble idea of, you know, doing these changes, but if they're not deep structural changes, and that's why I emphasize that transformation has to happen at several layers simultaneously uh, uh, in different sectors of the society. So the university by itself cannot really go against neoliberal practices like the ones you mentioned. Um, but there are things that the university can do to challenge some of these practices. And we've seen, you know, uh, such practices, uh, even with the uh, knowledge production. I mean, different ways of, of reviewing, different journals, different ways of, of, of co different structures of conferences. So there have been efforts. Now, my fear, which is your fear, is what if this become mainstream? Do we, do we still retain the criticality of critiquing those and the hegemonic, new hegemonic discourses that they might uh, impose? And so that's an open question for me. I, I don't have an answer to this one, but so I agree with you that it's important to be vigilant. It's important to critique constantly ourselves and not ourselves, but relationally, to come to uh, Encarna's question about, you know, relational justice and, and distributive justice. Uh, that, that's why I mean, relational justice is important because distributive justice by itself, it's like ticking the box, having, you know, giving, uh, distributing certain uh, uh, possibilities. So have a quota, for example. Uh, in the number of black students or black faculty in, in a university and thinking that this is a structural uh, change that will uh, bring, um, 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 you know, broader transformation. Uh, 
No, this is not enough. And this is misleading. And this is actually the kind of change or justice that might uh, mislead us into thinking that there are good things going on. There might be some good things going on and some changes uh, that are happening, but they are not enough unless there are these bigger structural radical changes. So uh, I, I would be more interested in how do we bring radical change in a strategic manner? Because you might want to bring radical change, but your strategy might be you know, ineffective, and in a sense, at the end of the day, you will not achieve anything. So I'm also concerned not only about the, the vision of, 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 of the agreement in the vision of radical change, but I think the strategy also matters. And, and that's for, and, and I cannot speak uh, for the context of South Africa, but I can speak for the context of Cyprus in which we are struggling for the past several years to bring even minor changes in um, uh, doing, uh, bringing together Turkey Cypriot and Greek Cypriot students. It hasn't happened for 45 years. Various sectors of the society resist the idea. And, in, and, and there have been efforts in the past, but they failed. Why? Because there wasn't a strategy. It was more a passionate effort of how nice to bring those kids together because it shows that we can live with each other, we can live in peace and so on. And it's not enough. You have to have a, a, a certain stepped, stepped process of pedagogically having a vision of bringing together students because you want to create a different society. And this, you do it gradually. You don't do it from one day to the, to the, to the next. So uh, w what I'm trying to say is that good intentions are not enough. You need a strategy and, 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 and leadership. And strategy and leadership is they are as important as the vision because you might have the vision, but without the means of achieving the vision, at the end of the day, so, so what? What's the difference you make? I don't know if I'm responding to uh, your issues, but. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. So I, 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 I found myself having, thanks firstly for that uh, very brilliant um, um, contribution. I found myself having a lot of uh, transferential moments, uh, not only with uh, what you were saying, but with um, sort of other concepts uh, and, and, and thinkers at the same time. The one is uh, when you mentioned uh, those six points by Janssen, and I think uh, Salim uh, briefly um, touched on that. Um, is a particular conception of knowledge that I think um, uh, Jan, uh, those, 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 those six points by Janssen uh, are predicated on a particular conception of knowledge as uh, knowledge as knowledge about knowledge. Um, that's, that's, that's the one thing which I think um, I'm wondering what that does for, for, for our, um, our efforts at transformation. Um, and then the other is yeah, sure, sure. So, so the idea that um, I mean, the, the the six points that are mentioned there um, um, assume a particular um, uh, um, movement toward knowledge uh, 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 as an object, almost, um, rather than knowledge as something um, that emerges um, 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 in 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 the shared intensity of the now. Um, and, and knowledge is something that can be produced. Um, that's, that is something that you might even attain without knowing that you're, you've attained it, right? Um, um, in the same way that it's something that is, um, 
you know, when, when, when does the moment of learning happen? Does it happen at the very moment that, 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 that you encounter it or does it happen much later? Um, um, the unfolding of a situation that is happening. How do we, how do we speak about, how do we, how do we understand a, a, a moment that, that, that might be knowledge that we don't quite yet know is knowledge, um, right? And that, I think, has implications for what, uh, for what, for what, for what we're, we're talking about. But that, that's, that's really an aside. Uh, the real thing I wanted to get to um, was the, uh, you said here that the, the you know, strangers tied together by uh, a common fate. And I'm wondering um, whether or not we maybe are not taking for granted the commonness of that fate um, and, 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 and how we would know, how, 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 how will we know that we have achieved shared fate? Shared fate, shared fate. Um, shared is different than, than, than common, but how do, how, how do we, I mean, how would we know that we, 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 we've, we've attained it, right? Like, yeah, how, 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 how you know, what, how, how would we know we've attained it and what, and what are the conditions for its possibility? Um, is 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 um, is the other question because it does I think bear as well on um, um, the idea about you know these micro level relationships that can accommodate respect compassion uh, solidarity how do we know that we've achieved what will that look like what what I mean I can I can almost see it in its um, um, in its form but what are its affective dimensions what what moves it um, and I think yeah that that's that's the, that's the, yeah, that's the one question. And then I'm also interested in your million dollar question as well um, about soft reform, radical reform and beyond. I know, I know, I, I'm, 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 I'm interested in what these kinds of questions about, about um, visceral, emotional and commonsensical uh, uh, um, refiguration. I'm interested in what, 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 what that means for our ability to understand uh, or, or, to, or to show up to this million dollar question because I'm not quite sure what the affective dimensions of this shared um, situation will look like. Um, I don't know what drives it uh, because I thought that you know, we, we, we were all um, um, fighting for, for one thing during fees must fall, but it turns out that zero percent is enough to, you know, um, to, to 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 subdue the the the, the radical potentiality of, of something like decolonization, which itself can be co-opted. So how do we know that we've arrived at something that's either shared or common or or whatever it is that I think respect and care is predicated on? And I would like us to maybe apply some pressure to that a little bit. Thanks. Um, thanks, Michalina. So it was great as always. Um, apologies for not being being present at the at the book launch. So maybe a little bit out of, of order with some with a comment. Um, but I think that um, Salim, you 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 spoke about how the work with the with the workers. Uh, assisted the, the students in the, the fees must, must fall, actually, in, in terms of their, their collaboration. We saw it at the university where we are and uh, how, you know, they were able to then take things quite a bit, bit further. I, I also, I, I'm trying to reflect on, the, the, on some of the problems with regard to, I suppose, disruptive, you, you, you kind of speak about, you know, disruptive and discomforting situations and how, if we had not had that, those you know disruptive situations, we would not, we would probably be maybe been waiting for another like ten years for um, the fees must you know fees to to fall, uh, because we as as human beings and as people kind of co-opted into the middle class setting at at universities is not in our nature to be you know disruptive, so. I think that that is that's one of the, the difficulties that we face, where we are located in the higher ed, ed system. And so the question that you're posing about the public good and in this very un, unequal society is um, what is needed in terms of that change in the, the un, you know unequal society, and. Um, if we look at the history of struggles, then we'll see that how 
um, with the one phase of apartheid, let's call it the, the toppling of the part of the political uh, kind of struggle there, the motive forces in terms of people who are to come together from different sectors, uh, especially the, the working class and, and the unions, uh, what kind of a role was played, played there. And I can't see it happening uh, at the moment in this country. I think we can have some discussions about public good and, you know, um, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of uh, some of the, uh, the issues at university level. But until there is some real movement in the society, in the, the civil sort of society, and, and, and people there start, start pushing for some real change, if we're talking about an egalitarian sort of system or something, I, I think that we're kind of tinkering. Which maybe at this stage, that's that's this is you know as good as good as it gets, you know that uh, we're able to work with um, young students, young young minds, and uh, they being you know being radicalized, and uh, and maybe they going to they the ones who are going to take us further together with the other other motor forces. But uh, I'm just I'm just posing it as a caution because it's something we kind of think that we doing all these radical things at, at university level. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, uh, uh, Chairperson. I, I still need to learn how to ask questions, but I'll get it right. Thanks, Prof, for the good presentation. Uh, in this uh, great week of uh, plasticities. Um, I want to ask about the, the public good, and I'm not highlighting public good because it's a tagline I, I picked up. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's actually a concern I, 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 I it's, a, it's an inquiry I have from, 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 from the, because I, I was listening that one of the key questions you ask is how can colonial universities be disloyal to colonialism for the public good? Um, because the, the public good in South Africa is a very ideologically contested uh, concept, you know. Um, public good, what do you mean? Which one? Um, because when they clean the garden in South Africa for 67 minutes, they say they are doing it for the public good. Um, you know, when we we're protesting for free education, they, you know, racists told us we, we pay vet already, so we are, we are loyal to this country. We are, doing, we are paying tax for the, the, the public. Why must we pay more now for you to go to school again, you know? So, by public good, what are, you, what are you referring to? And also, what are the injustices of that public good? Um, because it, it, it could be a public good, but also an injustice as well. To, 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 that, that, that public good, you say it's a public good, it's an injustice to another uh, se sector of society, you know. For an example, we, one could argue that um, land expropriation without compensation is for the public good. You know, it, 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 would, it, it could restore some form of economic justice. But the, the concept itself does produce some injustices as well mm -hmm. for other people as well. You mm -hmm. know? So th that's the question I wanted to, 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 to pose um, on, on, on what we, were you referring to on, on that one. And then lastly, Whenever a, a, a very sophisticated presentation on decolonization is made, I always find myself having to, 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 to listen carefully as in, what are you saying exactly? You know, I, I wish this could be said in a simple way so that I can go out now and practicalize it. You, and so in fact, the question to ask is, what makes such 
explanation of concepts so complicated to the people that, are, that it's supposed to serve? Why is it difficult to listen to it? Why, why do I have to make an extra effort to, to understand what you... Basically, the, the, the language of a, of a professor, yeah, what, what, what makes it so aloof? Um, is it, 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 could it be part of a decolonization project to make the language listenable? Um, in a, in, in, in high, the, so the, those are the questions I, I, if you can help me un, understand that. I don't know if I'm making sense. From the questions that you ask, uh, Pedro, I, my understanding is that you understood very well <laughs> what I said. Because, the, you know, by asking what public good is, this is, this is exactly what I said, that this is, this is an open question. I mean, it's not obvious what public good is, and as you said very nicely, uh, some understandings of public good might be unjust for some, for some groups. So this, these uh, issues have to be negotiated and discussed and have to be constantly negotiated. So there is no, there is no definition of public good. There is no, there's not an absolute category uh, or, or a sentence to give you and say, this is public good, precisely for the reasons that you said, because there are competing interests, because it's complex, because you know, there are all these historical, political, and other tensions that make, you know, uh, make the manifestation and the enactment of, of public good a very challenging thing. So wh wh what I would respond to, to, uh, to your question is, um, you know, keep, keep asking those questions. <laughs> keep challenging, you know, the issues that you, you, you just raised because there are no absolute answers, but they have to be discussed if they, if they are not being discussed or if they are seen through a particular lens you are asking, is there something else that I'm forgetting here? Is there, is there a perspective that could you know, give me a different, uh, a different lens in, 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 in this debate? So I think you said it very well. Uh, I'm sorry, next time I'll try to, to be <laughs> more, uh, more clear in some of the uh, argumentations, but in my mind, y you uh, you described very well what I was trying to get across. Now, um, th there was another qu yeah, your your question. How do you know uh, when compassion and care and solidarity uh, are enacted? Um, I'll give you a very simple example. Look at Andre Kitt and look at the spaces that he creates, the spaces that I've experienced with him in the past 10 years, both at uh, the institute at UFS and the, the kind of solidarity and compassion and humanity that he shows. Perfect example of that. This is what we need. I'm not saying more of this. I'm saying different manifestations of this kind of humanity and care that create spaces for transformation. I don't know if I have more better example than this. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Michalinos. I, I enjoyed that. Very much, and I, I think the, the question that I want to um, to ask maybe uh, uh, piggybacks on on Pedro, who's, who's just left the room, which is um, really about how does one go uh, take from the philosophical, which is really how your argument uh, um, kind of impacts on us is to think philosophically about these issues and how does the philosophical and the practical then come together. Mm. And, I, and I think about, you know, one of the opening remarks that you made about 
paradoxes and contradictions. And so my question relates to that. Um, how, does one, how does one locate oneself within the paradox, the set of paradoxes and contradictions that we live in? Uh, one example being how we, we fight for something and we struggle towards something. And then when that thing comes, suddenly it's, it's not the thing we fought for or struggled for. It takes on a different form. Mm. It could be that we say it gets co-opted. It could be we say that it gets mainstreamed and by the very nature of it becoming mainstreamed gets taken up in so many different ways that it no longer looks like there that radical yeah. thing that we were fighting for. I think about something like humanizing pedagogy mm -hmm. at our yeah. institution and depending, and so our, our, our fight and our struggle is to get it known and owned and absorbed and embraced. And when that happens, the critique that this is not what we actually said, it's not about being nice to each other, it's actually about something far more radical mm -hmm. than yeah. that. So how does one live with that contradiction and, mm -hmm. and what then centers, what centers what we hold on to that continues our struggle towards that shared fate <coughs> that reflects the kind of social justice we want. Thanks a lot, Professor. I was <laughs> raised differently, you know, <laughs> that when I talk, I must stand, just give respect to the, <laughs> the speaker in front. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't mean you uh, prophecy. <laughs> um, Thanks a lot for the presentation, uh, uh, Professor Zembilanos. Okay. Uh, my question is a two-facet question. Firstly, I just wanted to find out, I'm, I'm you know, not from um, an academic background or a professional background, but as a mere man, you know, um, in the quantum of your critical approaches to, to, to transformation, when we uh, spoke about soft reform, radical reform, and uh, beyond radical reform, I just wanted to find out um, where would you place our university? <laughs> and um, the, the second part of my question would be, you, you, you mentioned something about um, political transformation is not an intellectual exercise, which I, I really, like that and I respect that. Um, but what I wanted to find out, um, oh, you know, with, with, from that point, did you mean that uh, this whole um, political transformation in the higher education space is, is, is not something that can be manipulated intellectually? or it's not something that can be maybe configured in a way? Or what did you mean by that? Actually, I just wanted to just find out. Thanks a lot. I meant, I'll start with this, uh, with the, the last question. I meant that it's not, it's not merely an intellectual exercise because that will limit it into, you know, inaction. And it has to be, it's, it's an affective, emotional process, very intensive and full of tensions, but at the same time, it has to engage in practical actions like you all, you're suggesting different speakers earlier. So um, th that's what I meant by, um, the, by this comment. Now, the other question, I don't know. I don't. I mean, this is this is something that you have to reflect on at which stage this university is, or what needs to be done. And I'm sure that you know you've dis you've been discussing this in the past few years, from from what I know. Um, so I cannot really, as an especially as an outsider. Uh, now, uh, Denise's question, uh, which is excellent. Um, I think what keeps us going is the vision. And uh, 
And it's, it's like Andre's um, uh, inaugural speech the other day. You have the desire, but when the desire is fulfilled, then you, f you, f you either feeling empty or you realize that deep down that desire was not fulfilled in the way or you are unsatisfied. So I, I guess living with paradoxes and tensions, it's part of the game of engaging in, in these difficult processes of decolonization and, and, and transformation. I, I don't, I, I'm not sure if there is any other way. Uh, what keeps you going is, you know, your, the commitment to, to, to be engaged in, in social justice and to see the transformations no, perhaps not in the way that you envision, because your own way changes along the way as well. I mean, you, you're doing this collectively. You're not, you're not on your own uh, bringing those changes. You are struggling with others to define this and give it a shape. And then you, when you reflect and reach a point, you see, okay, you, you, you make your assessment and you say, well, I'm not satisfied. This is not, this is not enough. We have to move beyond that. And so it's like this constant process of, of interrogation, of looking uh, into, into the project and, 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 and correcting, quote unquote, the mistakes that you've done and, and you know, moving forward, having the vision, the, 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 the big vision of, of social justice and what it means in this setting, always like in mind. So I, I guess this would be the closest that I would, I would say. Michaelinus, I, I want to thank you for a really great talk. Okay. Inspirational as always, thank you very much. I'm really struck by that slide, the last one. I'm this kind one. of like Mo, stuck on commonsensical. And I want to go back to what you said about what strategies do we need to develop, right? And um, thinking about commonsensical refiguration is something that is very striking for me at the moment, especially when I think about, I'm not going to do a keynote, sorry, my question will be short, especially thinking about how like racism works at the level of the visceral, the emotional mm. and the commonsensical and how difficult it then is to shift, you know? And I was just thinking to myself, what kinds of strategies then, to put it in this managerial way, could be used to create this commonsensical refiguration that we need if we're going to get, you know, the political transformation that's so necessary? Um, because I've been trying for a while, I just need some tips. Thank you very much, Mikilinos. Mikilinos. Yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. You spoke about discomfort. And as I sat through the presentation, I had a number of discomforts. And so I thought maybe I should share it. Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should. So now I'm going to share it. Good. The first discomfort that I had was a very personal one. It was, why is Mikilinos, a guy from Europe, talking about decolonizing? To us, like, you know, it, and then it was, but I'm really enjoying this rich and deep and presentation that's raising all these questions. But I had that feeling. It was a feeling that crossed my mind. And then the second was, why are we talking about decolonization removed from the struggle from which, in which the term grew? Is that okay? Is, 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 from the term? From the struggles in which that term, the language, grew, is that okay? And I didn't answer the question to myself, but it raised a set of questions for me, and it was a little bit of a discomfort. And then the third was, is Michaelinos talking about knowledge as if it's removed from power? Is that how I'm understanding? Am I understanding it wrong? And again, I couldn't answer it. It was just a feeling. And the, the fourth was, but why is Michelino citing Aristotle when we're talking about decolonization of the public good? So I had these moments 
kind of waves, if you like, of <gasps> where I've felt things. And um, I've decided to share it because I don't think that we can embark on a conversation like this without actually sharing our emotional discomforts. And I think part of the discomfort was of having supported the Fees Must Fall movement, having been part of those discussions, having engaged with students who were debating in such rich languages and rich conceptual frameworks, these topics, you know, and not really seeing them in the room and missing them and missing their voices and missing the wealth that we'd engage with in those spaces. And this is also very rich, it's not like I'm saying this, this isn't, but just feeling stuff. And you know, um, yeah, thank you very much. Because Jackie wants the one last picture. Okay, yeah. I just wanted to add to what, what, what she was talking about, the discomfort. Uh, my discomfort was about talking about the public on their behalf and where are they in this, uh, or do we as a higher education sector, do we speak on their behalf? Where are they in the, or, yeah, where's the broader society, civil society in this discussion? Um, and then I also wanted to ask you, uh, Michalinos, I asked you on Saturday your response to what Spivak said about us fetishizing, I don't know if I got the word right, decolonization. Um, I, I think I've, I've slightly responded to this. Yes, there is always the danger of fetishizing decolonization, just like fetishizing the critical project. And that's why uh, Salim is right, that uh, you, you have to be always vigilant and, 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 and reflecting whether your critical project is co-opted by something else, colonized by something else. Yes. <laughs> your decolonization is colonized. Um, so... Um, what was the, the question that... Um, oh, who is, who is defining the, the... Who is... I mean, who is the we? Yeah. Yeah, but we cannot speak uh, on behalf of, of, of other people. So uh, that's why it's a process of negotiation. And that's why it's a, it's, it's a complex, ongoing process of negotiation. You cannot speak on behalf of somebody else. Uh, so, you speak as from your positionality as a university professor in this particular setting, and you you know you express your uh, your view about the public good. Um, I'm, I'm glad you sh you shared your your discomfort. It means that it spoke to you in some uh, discomforting way. <laughs> So, um, I, I'm not sure if I, um, if I can respond in a satisfactory manner about why um, s uh, somebody from uh, post-colonial Cyprus who used to be, uh, you know, uh, a British colony and marked its history in, in many, many ways. Um, I don't know if it's a matter of, of, of having the right or not to speak about uh, decolonization in a, different, uh, in a different setting. You're right, in a sense, I'm, I've never denied being an outsider, and I don't think I will ever be an insider, even if I move here. Um, so, I declare my, uh, my being an outsider, having the experience of, of living in a post-colonial society that is still suffering in many ways uh, from, uh, from British colonialism. So if that gives me even the slightest of rights to, to speak about it, then I, I'll claim it. <laughs> Uh, now, in terms of, of uh, the strategies uh, that Shirley is, is, is asking, um, it's a long discussion in terms of, you know, if we're talking about university structures, then you have to have, as, as a management of, of a university, 
you have to have strategies, not only policies, but, but strategies of going in a, in a, in a wise, in a wise step-by-step -step process of introducing and challenging some of the norm normalities that are taken for granted in the, in the institution. Now, I mean, it's, it's an abstract discussion, so we have to make it more specifically, if you're talking about racism, you know, at a higher, uh, uh, you know, at the university, for example. It's not enough to introduce anti-racist uh, policies or a code of contact um, if at the micro-political level, on an everyday you know, fashion, there is this reproduction of racist practices. So you might have the best uh, policies and at the end of the day, this is, you know, racist practices are being, uh, so unless you recognize that this is happening, the way it's happening, that policies will not by themselves save you, you cannot have a strategy. And what would be the strategy when you recognize these complexities is, you know, sit down, with, with your faculty, sit down with the students, sit down with the stakeholders, and say, you know, and, and, you know, and, and touch on the difficult matters, on the discomforting matters, and say, this is what's going on, and we need to find a way to, uh, to change the institutional structure. And it's not easy to change institutional cultures and structures. It's a long process, uh, and that's why you need, uh, you need so I cannot be more specific because the more specific would be to look at, you know, um, uh, Leeds Beckett University, to look at Manchester University and what's going on. That's why ethnographic studies of, of universities and schools are so important because they get to the nitty gritty details of the micro-political and, and it's not, it's not the misconception is that many things happen at the macro-political level. So policies and other things might change. And it's, it's not at the macro-political. You cannot forget the micro-political level. And that's where the strategies are needed, at the everyday micro-political level. Thank you. I think we need to bring this um, lively discussion to a close. I want to thank Mikalinos for the presentation. It's given us a lot of thought. And thank you for being part of Cresciate and bringing so many new perspectives and ideas to the team to challenge our own thinking. We thank you for that. And thank you to everyone for participating um, to this evening. And I remind you that tomorrow at 4 o'clock, we're hosting another um, honorary professor, Shirley Ann Tate, who will be speaking about whiteliness and institutional racism, which is another exciting topic that we really want to get a lively discussion. And um, if you're unable to join us, please go visit our website at cresciate.mandela.ac.za and see what we're up to, see who we are, and keep up to date with all the events that are still planned for the rest of the semester. Thank you very much, and please be nourished. There's still lots of food and drinks, and have a lovely evening. Thank you.